We've had uh, one Delaware judge in the past. We now have three coming up, uh, which is a record for us, and, and maybe we'll just hear some cases. No, we're going to have a fun conversation. And so, uh, Bill, I'll turn it over to you to uh, introduce and formally welcome our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, I get to do a little bit of the intro here. I'm Bill Lafferty, and I'm, I'm a partner at Morris Naples Arston Tunnel, and I've spent about the last 30 years litigating cases before the Court of Chancery. Um, and then down at the end is my good friend and colleague, David Berger, who's a litigation partner and advisor at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati here in California. But David, like me, has spent a lot of his career litigating uh, cases in Delaware and advising Delaware companies. Next, and we're very lucky here today because not, not only do we have one, but we have two, we have three current or former Chancery Court judges here, um, the Chancellor, Kathleen McCormick, who joined the court in November of 2018 as a vice chancellor after a, a long career at, at uh, Young Conaway, Stargate, and Taylor as a litigator. And she became the first female chancellor of the court when Chancellor Bouchard stepped down in, at the end of April. And we have Joe Slites here immediately to my left, Chan Vice Chancellor Slites. He joined the court in 2016. It was hard to believe that it was only 2016, but um, it seems like it's been a long time, Joe. Decades. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Joe was a litigator also at Morris James. He practiced both in, in, in chancery and a very distinguished career at Morris James and was a, served 12 years as a, as a superior court judge as well and, and established the complex commercial division in that court. Uh, and then last but not least is our honoree here today is Chancellor Andy Bouchard, um, who led the Court of Chancery for over seven years. He was appointed uh, by Governor Mark Kell, I guess it was, yep. back in, in March of 2014, and he served through the end of April. Uh, and he recently joined the, the firm of Paul Weiss as a um, And, you know, he led the court over those seven years with a very calm and, and steady hand through some very turbulent times. Um, the former chancellor was well known, I think, for his, his stellar work ethic, his keen intellect, and um, his overall just judicial demeanor. Um, and not to mention, I, and I always razz him about this, is the relative brevity of his opinions, which is really appreciated. <laughs> and by our rough research, I think the chancellor had issued uh, around 160 or so formal written opinions, numerous other oral rulings, literally thousands of orders in those seven years, uh, all while leading the court um, administratively and successfully pushing for the expansion of the court uh, and steering the court through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and many of cha the chancellor's opinions are gonna uh, have a lasting impact on Delaware law. And we're gonna talk about a few of those, including the Trulia and the Corwin opinions, and there are many others. And his opinions were always well-crafted and spot on and, and written with a style that made them easy and dare I say, actually enjoyable to read. Um, <laughs> and, and I speak for everyone on this panel, and I think in the audience and in the greater you know, corporate legal community and, and that we thank you for those you many know. years of, uh, of service to, to not just to Delaware, but to the, the broader national legal and corporate community. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you, Chancellor, just for some, at least some introductory remarks and maybe some reflections from you on, on some of the highlights uh, of your seven years. And then we're going to ask questions, and then we're going to leave time for members of the audience. If you have questions that you want to pose to Chancellor Bouchard or Chancellor McCormick or Vice Chancellor Slights, uh, we would welcome them. So. All right. Thank you for the gracious introduction, Bill. I really appreciate it. Um, so highlights. I guess I'll break it down into uh, two parts. Uh, one is uh, sort of the issues of substantive law during the seven years I, I served as Chancellor. Um, the key ones, I think, and then uh, on the administrative side, because the chancellor has all oversight and administrative responsibility for the operations of the court. So on the substantive law side, and I'll, I'll try to do this roughly chronologically in, the, in my seven years, the, the key issues, I think, were one, uh, recalibrating how the court responded to disclosure settlements, which led to the Truia decision. Um, second, really doing the bookend of defining the standards of review post-close in m and litigation. Um, the same standards basically that were defined in the mid-80s, you know, 30 years earlier, in real time, pre-close, you know, Unical, Revlon, Moran, and so forth. 
the, the period sort of around 2014, 2015, and a few years later, we're really defining those standards in the post-closed context. Specifically, the one I had the most significant hand in was Corwin, because I decided the trial court opinion. Cornerstone was decided, um, as well as MFW, and all the evolution of the cases really fleshing out both those doctrines. I think that's the second big uh, significant development. The third was sort of an interregnum uh, between uh, those two things and the, the last two I'll mention, which was sort of the, the resetting of the way the court approaches uh, appraisal cases. Not necessarily <laughs> controlled by the Court of Chancery, but sort of uh, redefined by the, the Supreme Court, but we obviously had to work through that and implement that. And then the, the last two, I think, and again, sort of in chronological order, um, would be one would be the Caremark developments uh, with sort of the latter part of my tenure from March on on and how it really uh, did change things and the continued growth in very significant commercial cases and particularly broken deal or MAE cases and particularly in the pandemic which really uh, it was basically an opportunity to renegotiate deals and there were a lot of cases especially that occurred after March of 2020. Uh, on the administrative side, I think you already summed it up. I think the two most significant things on the administrative side for uh, sort of my tenure was number one, um, you know, working very hard to get the court expanded from five to seven members, constitutional officers. And, and second, uh, really taking on the first part of the pandemic. My colleague over here, former colleague, I'm sorry, um, has handled the back end of the pandemic, but we had to sort of deal with it uh, and I think did so you know, pretty effectively. So I, I would sum up those are the, the, the big issues. <clears throat> do, you, do you want to start? Maybe we could talk a little bit about Trulia. You mentioned that case is one of, uh, one of the, sure. the, the highlights. Maybe you could give us a little bit of background on it and what <clears throat> led to the opinion and, and maybe what are some of the lasting impacts of it and maybe unforeseen impacts of yeah. the opinion. So Trulia, what was behind Trulia had been brewing before I got to the court and there had been a number of occasions when I think judges were taking a harder look at proposed settlements. Um, but, but let's maybe put a little of this in context. Uh, if you go 10 years before Troy, Troy was uh, January of 2016, it was decided. You go 10 years earlier, less than 40% of M&A transactions resulted in litigation. Um, immediately before Troy, it was roughly 96%, this explosion of litigation. Um, just intuitively, it can't be that 96% of cases have some meritorious claims underneath of them. Um, and what was happening is obviously a high percentage of those cases were not litigated in any forceful way. They were resolved in basically a deal, a compact between the plaintiffs and defendants, where by using the leverage of a PI hanging over a deal, uh, plaintiffs' attorneys could uh, you know, extract a settlement where they would obtain therapeutic benefits in the form of disclosures, which can be perfectly appropriate if it's truly material information, uh, but they were extracting, I think, uh, you know, disclosures that were of marginal, if not zero value, uh, obviously obtaining a fee for that. They were running around three, four hundred thousand uh, dollars per case on average, uh, some as high as 600,000, some even a little higher than that. And the defendants were all too willing to accommodate it because they would go away with the release, often overly broad release. Uh, and there were serious issues associated with that. Um, and most fundamentally, it's a non-adversarial process. That's a horrible way for a court to do business, is not to have things in an adversarial process where the issues are really in sort of the crucible of, of counter-arguments, so you can then make a judgment uh, and consider all sides presented. You're the judge that ends up being the adversary, and it's really not the appropriate role of a court. Uh, and it's not adversarial, and it wasn't really benefiting anybody. And frankly, as a matter of hygiene, it just got to a point where I thought, you know, the court sort of needs to change direction on how we deal with that. And I've said this publicly before, but it was, I think, the one and only occasion uh, when I drafted opinion and circulated to all my colleagues at the time. I think this predates both of you, but all my colleagues at the time to make sure that as a court, because this was really a policy decision we were making, that we had buy-in and it was uniformly uh, in support of, of taking a different direction. And the direction really was to say, again, we weren't saying disclosure settlements are banned. The, the standard of plainly material came from the notion that, well, you just better have a pretty obvious case for it, that it is in, indeed material information to justify it. And the, 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 um, the releases should be proportional to what's really at issue. Uh, so the bargains of the past really wouldn't be um, just casually approved. They'd be scrutinized much more heavily. And uh, I think you know, that was the right tone to set, and I think it was the right message to send. 
Um, and I think um, I foresaw more or less what would happen, and I think it's reflected in the opinion. And, and the trends that you see afterwards are sort of interesting, and I think there are like four or five key trends. First, in the aggregate, the number of deal challenges did go down, not dramatically, but it did go down. Um, so truly, again, was uh, January 2016. So 2016, the tail end of the year went down into the low 70s. Uh, 18, 19, it was in the low 80s. Um, and that's both federal and state, uh, state courts. So you had just less of the litigation. Uh, second trend, and I foresaw this uh, happening because inevitably, um, you know, plaintiffs firms will go where they think they get the, the best audience, right, to, to, uh, to have the best results for what they're interested in pursuing, that they would go to other courts. And indeed, you could take any Delaware state law, you know, fiduciary duty disclosure claim and turn it into a 14A claim, and they went to federal court. So before Trulia, roughly 60%, which actually coincides with sort of Delaware's market penetration of Fortune 500 companies, Roughly 60% of deals were being litigated in Delaware um, state court, others, other state courts and other federal courts. Um, two years after Troy, 90, over 90% are being litigated in federal courts, so a wholesale shift. Now what's interesting also on the federal court side, and I, I don't have the data for you know, sort of past 2019, what I mentioned before and the overall percentage of federal and state court challenges post Troy in those three years. But if you look at the latter years, um, in the federal side, they started coming down very dramatically in 2018, 19, and 20 in, in the beginning of this year. So 17 and 18, like 190 federal M&A related cases. Um, 2019, I think it was roughly 160. 2020, 100. First half of this year, 12. Very dramatic hmm. trending down. And Fourth trend, which is amazing to me, is all this action was in really a handful of firms, literally four or five. And amazingly to me, and I had somebody look up the recent information just to see sort of what's happening right now, you look back at last year and this year, one firm effectively, actually it's two firms, but they always work together. One firm essentially, or team, uh, accounts for over 70% last year and over 80% this year. I mean, that's, that's amazing, right, of the, of the filings that are pursuing disclosure, M&A cases, and largely in the district court, the federal court in Delaware. Um, the next trend is that everything is turned into mootness fees. And we actually, or I actually, in the opinion, suggested mootness fees are okay. Um, you know, it's, it's a business judgment a corporation can make. They can say, we'll resolve these, we'll moot your disclosure issues, we'll put it out there, we don't have to admit liability, we don't, we don't even have to admit their material. We're just going to put it out, out there and we'll, as a business judgment, you know, pay some consideration to do that, but we won't get a release. And in Delaware, uh, and this goes back to Bill Allen, uh, we require in that circumstance disclosure to the entity that's making the payment. Now, that's not going to provoke a lot of litigation. It would have to be almost a waste claim for somebody to pursue that, but it's some sunlight on that process. Flip to the federal courts, and what quickly started happening is nobody was settling. People just did loot this fees almost straight away. Virtually none of these cases hang around very long. 80, 90 percent are dismissed within the year they're filed um, without any settlement, and they're largely mooted. Um, and there's a problem with that from my perspective, which is the federal courts, unlike Delaware, don't have any sunlight of disclosure in their process, which is an area I think that really you know, cries out for reform. But, you know, and doctrinally what's interesting as well is I think, uh, and this, this is before everything was being mooted, um, most courts were either adopting, Eighth Circuit being the most dramatic in the Walt Green's case by Judge Posner, uh, Truia, uh, with some force, or at least saying it makes some sense, but not necessarily a wholesale endorsement. There were some outliers. New York was a clear outlier in that regard. But now that everything's mooted, there's case law, case law developments have come to an end uh, because the court never really has the settlement in front of it to make any holding or ruling or commentary about it. So it's an interesting place where it is, I think, but for the fact, which I didn't foresee, that the mooting of the cases in the federal court system wouldn't have any sunlight on them, it more or less sort of went to plan. The numbers are somewhat down um, pretty significantly after in the last two years. And uh, frankly, for Delaware's purposes, it's a, it's a better place for it, in my judgment. I'm, I'm curious, have you seen any of the judges on the panel, or former <laughs> judges as the case may be, 
Since you decided truly, it, have there been any disclosure-only settlements Very that few. have been presented and approved by the court? I, I can't say none. Um, I, I, I think there were a few, but very few. And remember, too, it's, you know, there's the pure disclosure settlement, and then they could be paired up with some other therapeutic, and then it has a sl somewhat different complexion right. depending on how strong those therapeutics are. Um, but I don't know if you've seen any. I haven't seen any pure disclosure settlements. Yeah. Did, I, did you expect the dramatic, like, day after yeah. shift? from that decision? I expected the shift. I didn't necessarily expect it as dramatic. And you'll see in the Truly Opinion, basically, there's a little section saying it's really going to be up to the other courts, basically, to buck up <laughs> and sort of take the same approach and, and nicely trying to encourage that they do so. I mean, it, 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 it was remarkable. It was, it was opinion issued, practice stopped. Silence, yeah. total silence. <laughs> it, it but you don't something. miss it, do you? There, <laughs> no, but it, it, there was no test. Right. There was no, well, what's plainly material mean? Yeah. Let's, let's test it out. Let's bring some cases and see what the boundaries are. It just stopped. Yeah. And yeah. I'm curious, when you make a decision like that, yeah. as you mentioned, it's clearly policy driven right. as opposed to you know, a legal precedent or something like that. What leads you, wh how, what were you thinking as you're going through this that I should make a policy decision that these cases should end as opposed to, you know, based on precedent or legal rules or something? Sure. Well, it's part of what I said before, which is it, it's just almost good hygiene. It was sort of unseemly to be in this non-adversarial process blessing things that I thought were sort of ridiculous. I mean, there were times, here's what would happen when I was doing these, fortunately, I didn't have to go through this drill exactly, but. Uh, before one of these hearings, I'd sit down with the proxy statement. I'd go through each of the disclosures that they claim is conferring some benefit. I literally found on occasion, um, you know, when they had a disclosure, they had a settlement proposal based on a disclosure that was already in the proxy. I found that on two or three occasions. But nobody was there to take the other side and point out, oh, it's already here, it's already there. It was, it was ridiculous for somebody to, to try to take credit, get a financial gain on something that was already disclosed. And that's, they were usually a list for every case, and there may have been some that had more validity than others. But by and large, they were, you know. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's the right word. I'm, I'm curious. I was <laughs> looking for something yeah. diplomatic. No. <laughs> well, and, and to follow up on that, like, so when you make a policy decision like that, did you feel comfortable that the Supreme Court was going to have your back? If, if it ever had gotten that far. You know, it's so funny because I won't name the person, but um, when it started happening, a comic came back to me like, hmm, we'll never see one of those cases come up, will we, as if they wanted to weigh in on it, right. but who knows. Yeah, no, I don't think anyone was brave enough to take that one up to the Supreme Court, <laughs> let me just say. David, I don't know if you want to lead us. Um, sure, I mean, it sort of goes, it goes along with this. You know, one of the um, truly remarkable features, I think, of the Delaware judiciary is your um, uh, thinking about these policy issues and speaking generally to broader groups like this one and, and, all the, and, and other groups across the country about Delaware's legal trends and legal policies. Uh, I'm wondering during your career and then particularly during COVID how that impacted you and first of all why you do it because when I go sure. out I don't see any California state court judges and very few frankly federal judges who go out on a speaking you know, to other right. broader audiences. So why do we do it? Um, I'll speak for myself, but I suspect the answer would be similar to, to what uh, my former colleagues would say. Um, just as everyone in the legal services business is in a service business, the court chantry is very much in a service business. Uh, we serve the people who litigate in our court. Um, we're, we're very fortunate to have sort of the market penetration of entity formation that we have in Delaware. Um, but Delaware works hard at the things that are important to maintain that. And I think the single most important thing to maintain it is the predictability of a result in a court and that you will get a fair shake. And part of promoting that brand, frankly, is to hit the road. And we learn from you, and you can learn a little bit from us. It's, it's, it can be awkward sometimes, because obviously the things we can't talk about, pending cases and so forth. Um, but I, frankly, enjoyed getting the feedback when I go to conferences. I mean, when you're working in a you know, your chambers, it gets a little lonely at times. It's nice to get the interaction and know what's going on. Uh, but it's fundamentally part of a service business. And uh, there's no, frankly, there's no harder working people than the two next to me here and the other people that are on that court uh, to make this work. And it's really the juice that makes the whole system work for Delaware. 
chancellor or vice chancellor, do you have anything yeah. to add? Yeah. I, I mean, know what, you both do a lot of it as well. What, what I'll say is it's, it's important to the court in the sense of a, a learning experience for us. So uh, next week, uh, the chancellor and I will sit with our colleagues and we'll talk about what was discussed here, not only on our panels, but on other panels, what feedback we got, um, and, and just, you know, sort of the general sense of how we're doing. And that's important, and the other judges are doing the same. So it's not that you go and, you know, do your thing and, and move on. There is time to reflect on, on conferences like this that are substantive, that are, you know, providing meaningful information, and we take it very seriously. And I think there's a long tradition of it, too, uh, going back you know, to the days of Chancellor Allen. He was really, I think, the trailblazer in that, and largely with the connection with, with um, you know, colleges and universities, and law schools, really, uh, to develop it. And he was a very academic-minded person, but I think he's the person who really opened the door for people to do that. Okay. Maybe we can switch gears and talk a little bit about Corwin, which is another one of the headliners. And, and in that case, Your Honor held that the, the legal effect of a fully informed stockholder vote on a transaction in which there's not a controlling st yeah. stockholder, um, that the business judgment rule would, would apply and insulate a transaction from all attacks other than waste, except it, um, e even if the majority of the board might have a conflict or not be disinterested. And you know, many, I think, people viewed this as uh, new law at the time. I'm, I'm curious, what's your reaction to that and, and just what the backstory is on, on the opinion and and again, it's one that has had a, quite an impact, I think, on, on, on cases being litigated in Delaware. I'm curious of the, the two sitting judges yeah. currently, whether they're still seeing a lot of Corwin motions being litigated. So uh, I, I'm not sure I, I appreciated, truly I knew what was coming, but with Corwin, I'm not sure I appreciated how significant a decision it would become. Um, first of all, the, the key holding, the ratification-based holding that. Bill just mentioned was like the tertiary ground, in my opinion. The opinion, it, it, this is a combination of KKR and an entity KKR had spun out like eight years before that was bringing back uh, KKR on 1% of the company. So the plaintiffs pitched the case as an entire fairness case on the theory that even though they didn't have a lot of voting power, um, they had a management relationship that gave them the kind of control, notwithstanding the fact that they didn't have the economic or voting power interest. I rejected that. Then the next argument was, well, a majority of the board have these allegiances, affiliations with KKR, and, and indeed, you know, the, it, from the spin out, there were a lot of people that dated back and had relationships with KKR, but when you do the head counting exercise, um, I rejected that because based on a person by person analysis. And, you know, I, I was a very young judge at the time, and frankly, I did something I didn't have to do, which was deal with the third ground. I could have stopped there. And I may, maybe, you know, I was more complete than I might have been later, but the third argument was made, well, this has been ratified. And the ambiguity in the law at the time was a case called Gantler that the Supreme Court decided. And the key issue was, you know, when you have a stockholder vote that is mandated by a statute, merger, you have to have a stockholder vote, versus one that's just voluntary that you impose on yourself as a condition of something, does it have the same ratifying effect? And there was ambiguity about Gantler. And I looked at the issue and I said, no, I, I think it doesn't matter if it's required by statute or if it's just a voluntary act of imposing an additional requirement that it has that ratifying effect. When the case went up on appeal, the plaintiffs changed their tactics. They didn't pitch this as an entire fairness case. They pitched this Revlon case. Um, and all of a sudden, this became a ground that I think very quickly Chief Justice Ryan seized on in terms of it's redefining. Re it's really stunning yeah. and almost unheard of for parties to change their arguments <laughs> at the Supreme <laughs> Court level and argue something new that they never argued to the trial court. Never happened. You never, never see happens. that happen. Well, it's even, excuse me, even more quote unquote stunning for the Supreme Court to take it on, right. even, <laughs> even though it wasn't briefed, right? Um, but no, but what was happening, and I think clearly, you know, Chief Justice Ryan was really, I think, behind 
defining these key standards, right? The bookend standards in the post-close context for deals that you know had evolved from the pre-close PI standards in the mid '80s, and that he did. He authored Cornerstone. He offered, uh, authored MFW at the trial court level. The Supreme Court aff affirmed, and he authored obviously the the affirmance in Corwin. And he went right to that tertiary ground because I think you know, he viewed that's where the law needed to be. Um, so what's happened after it? You know, the first concern I guess I had when I sort of when it sunk in what the effect of this could be was would this sort of be like a showstopper that was unjust in some way. And if you look at um, the data, again, I had somebody like check it. I, I'd given a lecture on this a couple years ago, so I had the data to like 2019, but I did like a, a download to bring, bring it up to date. By my count, there are roughly 41 decisions that decided at the trial court level a Corwin motion. There could be another ground for dismissal even when somebody denied a Corwin motion, but there were 41 decisions. 20 granted motions dismissed. So 21, you know, a little more than half, um, did not. Um, when you look at the reasons, it, there are really three fundamental reasons, but it's predominantly one. 13 of the 21 uh, where there was, um, I'm going to get these numbers correct, 13 of, of the decisions uh, involved disclosures. Um, I think two involved coercion issues. And, uh, and three, and I may have those two reversed, involved, um, you know, the. I guess it wasn't coercion. What, what's, what, am I, what am I leaving out here? The, another category, basically, of the requirements. Um, and um, control. But it, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There were arguments about some group <laughs> constitutes a controller, so it would be controller context. Um, and that was two or three, in any event. Uh, but it's largely the disclosure piece. And in some ways, that almost reinforces how I felt about this concept of ratification back when I was a practitioner, when I, I, I did both plaintiff and defense side uh, at different points in my career. And we were always nervous on the plaintiff side of a ratification argument being made in the damages context post-close because of this ambiguity surrounding Gantler. And, um, you know, it, uh, fortunately for us, <laughs> it, it always sort of worked out and it primarily worked out because you know, when you have a loyalty case and you have smelly facts, people aren't going to disclose everything. And the fact that so many really go away based on, uh, you know, the motions get uh, denied uh, on the grounds there's a disclosure problem, I think just reinforces. You have a bad loyalty case, you're probably not going to get out on a Corwin ground. Um, and, you know, I think that that's worked out to be more balanced than people thought. And the other factor that happened too is initially all of them were getting dismissed. But plaintiffs got smarter. They did more 220. This has put more pressure on 220, along with Caremark and Trulia. Um, and uh, uh, they got more effective at it. And I th the percentages then went down of the number that were actually granted. It, it, it really is a great illustration of, of sort of the fluidity of, of the corporate law. Because um, when, when Corwin was decided, notwithstanding, I think it's footnote 18, where uh, Chief Justice Strine took ratification cases back to 1918 yeah. to make the point that this is always not a law. big deal. It's always been our law. Nothing to see. Nothing to see. Um, it, yeah, it, the, the fact of the matter was that we were not, we, we were not, the Court of Chancery was not dismissing cases on the pleadings on the grounds of ratification. So when Corwin first came out, um, the message loud and clear there were almost all dismissals. I think the first at least yeah. half dozen, if not 10 to 12, yeah, that yeah. were right out of the were, box. Were just yeah. dismissals mm -hmm. out of the box. And so what, what good lawyers do is they, they read those opinions, they figure out where uh, the plaintiffs there fell short, and they adapt, they adjust, and they figure it out. And, and what they realize is you have to affirmatively plead around this affirmative defense. And for the litigators, you know, that's, that's an odd thing to require in a pleading that you're actually going to affirmatively plead around what the defendant ultimately has the burden of proving. But, but that had to happen. That has to happen under Corwin. And, and uh, the chancellor in another case made made that clear in the Yates case that this is a pleading burden. You have to demonstrate, if there's a stockholder vote in your complaint, that 
the vote was either not informed or there was a coerced vote. You've got to plead it. Or that there's a controlling stockholder. Plaintiff Scott got the message and started to figure it out. And in the Smelly deals, it wasn't that hard to do. Right. And so the dismissal started to trail off. But it was, it, it's a trend, and it's this sort of swinging pendulum that you hear used to describe the evolution, especially of governance law. Um, it, it absolutely is a pendulum. I always describe it that way, and it feels like it's gone to the <laughs> left right now. <laughs> That's just my, my, my perspective. One as a pers defense lawyer, right? Yeah, I know, as a defense lawyer, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna, I, and I don't, don't want to hog the floor, but I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, Chancellor. You know, when you decided to step down, did you, you know, leave some words of wisdom for your colleagues that are sitting here with us? And I, I'm not sure if you want to share it all with us, but I, I'm, I'm curious, kind of, and maybe. Vice Chancellor and the Chancellor can comment on some of the, the challenges that you perceive for the court and, yeah. and, and for, for the development of the law. It's word, I, I'm not sure I left any words of wisdom. I mean, it, it, the hardest part of retiring was uh, leaving my colleagues. I mean, I genuinely mean that because it's such a special group and it, it, it's like a foxhole and everybody truly had uh, everybody's back. It's really extraordinary and very, very committed people. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the words of wisdom I was given by Bill Allen. And I'm not sure I told you this before or, or <laughs> Not you. finally, but, no. uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we're at, uh, I think it was Albert, a nice Upper East Side you know, restaurant. And um, you know, Leo just uh, moved up to be Chief Justice. I don't even think I'd taken the oath of office yet. Bill Allen's there circulating, comes up to me, sort of puts his arm around me, goes, Andy, you know. Leo's super smart, and he's really, you know, he's so intelligent, and he's, he writes so long opinions, he's got all these detailed points to make. And then he leans over and goes, you should go for wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> and, which, okay. <laughs> I guess I'm not gonna be able to do those opinions. I take point taken, not even what I wanted to do. But I, I translate wisdom into judgment, and to me there's no more significant thing as a lawyer uh, than to have good judgment, and there's no more significant thing as a judge to have good practical judgment, to be very practical about what you do. And uh, that's always been my guide post. I think it's the guide post of these two people as well. And um, th that would be the advice I would give somebody. And, and chancellors, do you, what do you see as challenges that are, that are facing the court now? I mean, Katie, maybe you want to take that one. Sure. Yeah, the, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Andy. You left the court in amazing shape. He was, for those of you who don't know, the administrative burden on the chancellor is quite extreme. And, and, and as Surprise. I'm learning, as I'm learning, <laughs> and, uh, and the former chancellor was an exceptional steward for our, you know, the, the prize jewel of our, of our state's um, you know, system. Uh, and, and, you know, but the, the challenges ahead are, are big. You positioned us, Andy, to meet them. We still have work, workflow problems. Uh, I can't imagine where we would be if you had not pushed to expand the bench. I mean, we just, I don't think we'd be standing. Um, and so we'll, we'll be dealing with those, you know, <laughs> more of the same, <laughs> I suppose. How about some pointers? You have, you have some law students here, you have practitioners. What are some of the things you've seen? You, you were on the court for seven years. Yeah. You litigated in the court for a long time. And, you know, Chancellor and Vice Chancellor, you've seen lots of cases and lots of litigants come through. What, what makes an effective, what, what makes a lawyer effective in, that, in the court? Yeah. I think most judges are pretty interactive in the court of chancery. Um, and I, I know I was probably overactive, um, but I enjoyed arguments. And, you know, what are you looking for? Obviously, you want somebody to make you confident that the decision you're making makes sense. So the, the effective advocates are not overly scripted. They will not bring, come in with PowerPoints for everything they have to say. Every IP argument seems to be a PowerPoint. Um, they're fluid and will move with the argument. They'll concede things that it shouldn't be hard to concede, and they'll focus on what really matters, and they'll take the hard issues head on. And they try to get you comfortable because they've thought long and hard about what, you know, there's only going to be one or two issues that are really going to matter and turn things around, and they're going to be the tough ones and they're gonna to try to make you comfortable. If you go their way, it's consistent with where the law is, and they will make you comfortable with that. And, and the people that can do that successfully are persuasive, and being persuasive is the art of being a good advocate. Anything to add to that? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, I'll just add an accent. I, I, I think when the Chancellor is talking about feeling comfortable, what he's saying is that you're not going to do violence to the canon of our law, right. that there is not going to be some unintended consequence that in the, you know, the thicket of, of the dense record you have in front of you, you're not seeing the bigger picture. And so the good advocates come in and say, look, here is why it's the right result in this case. And this is also why it's the right result generally. Why it's not, it's either consistent with our law, but if it's gonna move the law in this direction, it's not gonna have un unintended consequences and you can feel comfortable with that. And probably more so than certainly most state courts, the Court of Chancery is, is just, fixated on that, on, on making sure that the steps that are being taken are steps that are deliberate steps, that are not going to have unintended consequences. And the good advocates know how to do that, so that when you walk out of the courtroom, you say, they can win, and they can win on this record, and in a broader sense, they can win, and we're not going to affect in a negative way what we built in terms of our canon. I'm curious, that when, you, when you go onto the bench, do you typically have an idea of which direction you're headed, or do you really come in you know, undecided? I mean, yeah. you know. so I, I don't know if I put a percentage on it. I, ballpark, 78% of the time, I have a direction, I have a pretty good idea based on the papers. Um, but I think what would surprise people is the number of times I change my mind. Something doesn't right, and I change my mind. And it, it's, it's our obligation to do that and not, you know, to get fixated too early and to get set too early. Um, yeah, I agree. Good advocates can change my mind. And I think what the chancellor just said is, is is the way it goes. I say to my clerks all the time, let's see how it reads. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you make the decision, you write it out, and then it's, it does, you know, we've seen it now in black and white, does it make sense? Are we in the right place? Do you think about how it might be on appeal? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, every politician wants to get reelected. <laughs> every judge does not want to get reversed. You know, um, and I, I, I can't believe that wouldn't be the case, right? Um, because, you know, you work really hard to get it right. I mean, people really care about what they're doing for the law and fundamentally what they're doing for the administration of justice that they get to the right outcome. And it's almost like, oh, hit me with a dagger if I get reversed on something. Uh, but you can't, you can't cower in the sense of you, you got to, like, stand up for what you really think the right call is and, you know, chips hole where they may, you just do the best you can to do that. I want to leave some time for questions, but I want to ask you one more thing, because speaking of the reversal issue, you, you had mentioned earlier appraisal being one of the areas uh, <laughs> where there was a lot of development in the law during your tenure. You were involved in the, uh, you decided sure. the DFC case yeah. as, as the trial judge. Sure. And the Supreme Which Court. Which was brutally reversed. The Supreme <laughs> Court went a different direction, let's just say. Maybe you could comment a little bit on that and, and your reaction. Obviously, it was a bit of a, 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 a tidal wave, uh, a change, I think a change in the law. I, I think right. the Supreme Court didn't see it that way, but. Um. I, I'm unburdened by having to worry about what they, they think, I think, who knows. Uh, so, I, I think where we should be, uh, where we are now is where we should be. I didn't quite like how we got there and wish it sort of happened a little differently because I think it was a fundamental change in the law without sort of acknowledging the law is being changed. And I, you know, I, I would like to see that path navigated differently. Um, but you know, if you, you sort of put it in a historical context, it's interesting because if you go like 25 years back, there were probably like eight or 10 appraisal cases a year. And of course, there was all this activity when members of the Supreme Court that were involved in changing this law um, were themselves writing appraisal decisions heavily dependent on DCFs. Um, the cases were ramping up, and there were uh, a number of notable outliers of actively shopped companies, you know, getting premiums to market, significant premiums to market in an appraisal case. Um, where the law has returned to, uh, with a really hearty endorsement of efficient markets, I didn't quite expect to see at that level, 
um, is a place where appraisal was basically 25 years ago, where it fits in private deals, it fits in smelly deals, when, typically when there's a loyalty issue. It fits in deals with controllers, but the actively shop, non-controller uh, company, you can you know, sort of bet your dollars it's going to be market you know, minus synergies as sort of the baseline. Um, and it's probably where it should be. I just wasn't, to be perfectly frank about it, very keen about sort of how uh, those decisions were sort of written um, you know, by taking to task factual findings as opposed to just saying, you know, maybe we need to like recalibrate where we are with, with the uh, sort of the, the net effect of appraisal decisions. And speaking of fluid changes, um, just looking at numbers, I think in 2018 with three months from 2017 added on, we were over 80 appraisal filings. Mm -hmm. And this year I think it's at what, six? Uh, if that. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things where a decision from the court or a series of decisions in this case can just totally change the perspective of those who uh, think there's a right worth pursuing and no longer think that to be the case. So, so we got more judges, we got less cases, so everyone's not very busy now, right? <laughs> I, I, I was just going to make a point. <laughs> See, that's, that's the amazing thing. As hard as you know, we work to get the court from five constitutional officers to seven, um, it is as busy as ever, um, and, and, which is really extraordinary. And it's not because of appraisal, it's not because of Trulia. It, it, there's a confluence of factors behind that, um, but, but it fundamentally is because of demand, because the, the product, if you will, that's a business in a sense, that it's a judicial business that the court puts out is a good product, and people want to litigate their cases there, which is, you know, what we strive for. It, it, it doesn't help that 40% this year, 40% of the filings are expedited filings. Well, they're accompanied with a motion to expedite, which right. requires the judge to drop everything and determine whether this case meets the standard for, yeah. you know, expedited proceedings. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an intense position. Many of the people in this room and you know what our court does at, at a business level, but they don't always know what you experienced for seven years, like the human side of the court. Mm -hmm. What aspects, if any, of that will you miss? Oh, I'll tell you what I miss. I think, w but for, oh my gosh, less than 10 weekends, I wrote opinions every weekend for seven years <laughs> um, and many nights. Um, because there's no other way to do it. Now, I'm, maybe I'm just a slow writer. <laughs> and you know, that's the way it goes. Um, but literally every weekend the drill was to write the opinions because I never had the time really to do it during the week. They always had like, something else going on with hearings and things like that. Same experience? Yes. Yeah, same experience? Right. And that's why this is public service. This is, <laughs> the money is irrelevant. This is a commitment to something that really matters. And, uh, and again, that, that Foxhole mentality of having this group you know, take that task on was the strongest sort of draw, the human draw uh, to being on the court. Uh, but that's what I miss. Well, I'm going to invite, if anyone in the audience has questions, I know I, we could go on for a long Quite time, so. but it's hard being the last panel between, uh, yeah, between the conference hour. and cocktail hour. <laughs> um, anyone in the audience want to want to pose something to the chancellor or one of the other judges on the panel? Seeing none. Everyone wants a drink. <laughs> well, we're going to give everyone two minutes back, and I, I you know, and I, I appreciate everything that this panel's done. Yeah. And give a hand to the chancellor Thank and the other judges on the panel. Thank you. So. Thank you.